Welcome to Go Publish Yourself, the author spotlights. I'm Justine Bilo, the author acquisitions manager for Ingram Spark. I'm very excited about today's guest. We are joined by the awesome Jason Pinter. Jason is the best selling author of five novels in his Henry Parker thriller series and the standalone novel, The Castle, which have over one million copies in print worldwide and have been published in over a dozen countries, as well as the middle grade adventures novel, Zeke Bartholomew Super Spy. He has been nominated for the Thriller Award, Strand Critic Award, Barry Award, RT Viewer Reviewer's Choice Award, Seamus Award, and the Crime Spree Award. He is also the founder and publisher of Paulus Books, an independent publishing company he launched in 2013. Woo, quite the bio. Welcome, Jason. <laughs> you're, embar- you're embarrassing me. <laughs> oh, stop. No, it is, it is awesome. Oh, thank um, you. Thanks for having you've me. Had- Oh, we're so happy to have you on. Um, and Jason's a, a New York guy like me, so I'm so excited to have a New Yorker on the podcast. Yeah. Well, I, I, say, I say displaced New Yorker because my wife and I moved to Hoboken, New Jersey about three years ago. So we're oh. right over the Hudson and we can still see New York, but not technically in New York anymore. But, you but can you were born and raised. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> Yeah, we moved too, so I I, I can't lie. So I I, I feel you on that one. Mm. So I so you've been in publishing for a really long time, but you actually didn't start your career as an author. Is that right? Yeah, no. My first very I, I, my very first job out of college was as an editorial assistant at Warner Books. Um, so I think oh, wow. it was just a a virtue of loving books, loving the written word. I think in the back of my mind, I, I loved writing and at some point wanted to write a book or get published, but I got into publishing totally independent of that. Um, I remember, you know, in college sort of wanting to learn the publishing industry, having no idea how to do it, having no, not knowing anybody. <laughs> so I literally just started, I sent letters to different like publishers and literary agencies, basically asking for internships. Uh, I ended up interning at a small boutique literary agency. Uh, and ended up, I had, before that, I had done some work um, over the summers at uh, the AP Associated Press Sports Division. And they, had a pretty oh, prominent, wow. and they had a pretty prominent client who was a sports writer. So I ended up working with him on his new proposal, basically helping him edit it. And I really just fell in love with that aspect of it, of the editorial aspect. And after that, I just, I started looking to get a job in publishing, got one. And yeah, I was in publishing for, I think, three, four years before my first book sold. Wow. So do you think being an editor actually prepared you for being an author? Uh, I, I always say it, it, I think it, it helped me in that uh, I tried to do all the things that authors did that I liked and tried not to do all the things <laughs> authors did that I didn't like, <laughs> Cause, uh, you know, <laughs> which, which, which I found easier said than done. Um, I think it helped in the sense that I was used to editing other people's books. So I was very mm. critical when it came to editing my own. Um, I think a lot of authors, especially now with the, the sort of ease of, of self or independent publishing, they'll, you know, write a first draft and, you know, want to throw it up online. But, you know, the importance of editing cannot be overlooked. So I, I do think it prepared me for that. Oh my gosh. I mean, we talk about that all the time on the podcast, how like, please get a good editor. We, yeah. we stand on our soapboxes all the time. So, I mean, probably coming to, to writing with that editorial eye already is just a totally different mindset. Oh than, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, uh, even before I started going out with, with my first book, the mark, uh, I think my agent and I did like nine or 10 drafts on it full, like <gasps> full drafts before we even started no. sending it out to publishers. Yeah. That's so many drafts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, to be fair, I think like it was my first book and I sort of, there were a lot of things I didn't know or needed to learn. I, I nowadays I don't do nine or 10 drafts. I can maybe do, you know, three <laughs> or few. four, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> I think that, that was just my virtue of learning the craft a little bit, but at the same time, mm. I mean, the, the book sold. So, you know, it was worth yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> And and sold very well. Too. Yeah, yeah, I was very happy. With yeah. It, yeah. So, did you always want to write? Did you always want to be an author? Um, you know, it, I don't know if I always wanted to be an author, and, I, and it's sort of funny because this is sort of like a little personal thing of mine. But I I always feel like 
author should be something that a writer aspires to be. Uh, I never wanted to call myself an author until I actually published a book because I felt mm. like it was sort of like a goal to achieve. So, you know, there are people who mm. go around and, you know, they're writing their first book and they say, oh, I'm, oh, I'm an author. And to me, it's sort of like it's it's uh, cutting the corners a little bit. Um, so when I say mm. I wanted to be an author, I would probably say I would love to write a book at some point, have it published, and mm -hmm. at that point I'll be an author. Um, you know, I wrote sort of crummy little short stories when I was growing up, and I wrote an absolutely, yeah. you know, when I was in college, I wrote an absolutely terrible coming-of-age story. I think it's a, it's a rite of passage <laughs> that everyone has to write one terrible coming-of-age story. Oh, um, oh, totally. I did it. Yeah. We oh, all yeah, did it. Yeah. It's in my drawer, and it will never leave, and, <laughs> and it is not worthy oh, of being Oh, God, no. <laughs> Unless I'm on like mortified podcast or something, it will never see the light of day. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's funny because I, every now and then I'll, I'll crack it open and be like, oh, this is actually kind of funny. Oh, this kind of works. Oh, no, that's absolutely <laughs> terrible. Put it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, they're a little horrifying to like yeah. look back on. <laughs> but, but I think, but I think it's sort of good to have that one, you know, drawer novel that you're never going to show to anybody. But at the same time, it's sort of like, it, pro I think it proves to you that you can do it. You know, you prove to you yeah. that you can put together 70, 80,000 words in a row and not all those words are terrible. <laughs> oh, totally. That you can actually finish something. Because I think exactly. for a lot of writers, it's like the finishing part is so daunting. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you know, when you when you think about, you know, whether it's in college or whether it's in school, you know, I think in, in when I was in college, I think, I think the longest thing I ever wrote was a 20 page term paper. Um, yeah. And to write something that's, you know, 15 to 20 times the length of that is pretty daunting. And, you know, you talk about writing and it's it's basically pu pushing a boulder up a hill. It's writing X number yeah. of words every day, day after day until you have a manuscript. You know, if you, if you look at it and say, oh, my God, I have to write 90,000 words, you'll have a heart attack. But if you say, hey, I'm yeah. going to write a thousand words a day for three months, you'll have a manuscript. Exactly. And that's really good advice to yeah. the people out there who find it, you know, a very scary task to do, you know, just think yeah. of it in those thousand word chunks. Exactly. And it's a little less scary. Exactly. Yeah. So you started your own publishing company a few years ago. What made you want to do that? Um, hmm, hubris. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think, um, you know, I think even when I was an editorial assistant, I love the idea of being able to be responsible for my own projects. Um, you know, I think there's a, a assumption with editorial assistants that you come in and you're answering phones and you're, uh, and you're taking notes for your boss and you're sort of doing due diligence and filing. And there's certainly a lot of that. But I acquired, when I, when I was an editor, I, I actually acquired a fair number of books when I was edit, an editorial assistant. Um, so I think, even from the get go, I never really wanted to kind of sit back and I hate to say like kind of pay my dues a little bit. I wanted yeah. to kind of be in charge of some stuff, but at the same time, I didn't know what I was doing. Half the time. So yeah. after I'd had enough time and experience under my belt, you know, I worked at three of the, you know, now you know, at the time they were the big six. Now they're the big five, but I worked at three of the big five publishers. I worked at one mm -hmm. of the largest and most respected independent publishers in the country in Grove Atlantic. Um, oh, and I'd also so published great. a number of my books. So I felt like I knew the publishing side pretty well. I knew the authorial totally. and editorial side pretty well. I'd actually put together a business plan a couple of years back. And it sort of got to the point where I was like, you know, it's now or never. Uh, my wife and I weren't married at the time. Uh, we didn't have any kids at the time. So it was like, mm. you know, my life is only going to get busier. And I didn't want to find myself at 45, 50 years old wishing I'd done it. It was the now or never exactly. kind of turning point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because, yeah. because I knew, I, I knew, you know, we were getting married. We did want to start a family eventually. My responsibilities were not going to get less. <laughs> so yes, that was the time. Exactly. Yeah. Life just gets busier. And so, exactly. yeah, it was your jumping off point. Exactly. And, and so what do you find the most gratifying part of it and then the hardest part of it? Because it's it, we all know in it, here in the spark world that it's not easy running your own indie publishing yeah. company. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would say um, the most rewarding part is when I when our books get good reviews, uh, when an yeah. author is happy about something, you know, I, I'd say the tr one of the hardest things about being an, a new independent publisher is 
making people aware of you and your books. Uh, you know, five years ago, we basically didn't exist. Uh, so now to be reviewed in all the major outlets and trade uh, and trade uh, and trade magazines is pretty great. So when we get a good review or a starred review or a major outlet takes notice of us, I sort of start to think like we didn't exist five years ago. So, for example, um, Library Journal, which is one of the more most prominent trade trade journals there. It's a magazine yeah. that goes out to thousands of libraries. They just did their big mystery preview and they and they featured three of our books. And wow. I'm just, I was, and like, you know, I think more books than Grand Central, more books than Berkeley, oh. more books than like Little Brown. And so when I That's look at incredible. that, I'm like, and I'm just like, you know, we didn't exist five years ago. We don't have a giant corporate backing. We're not Amazon. We don't have, you know, we're not part of Bertelsmann. Uh, yeah. To, to, for, our, for our sort of like indie publisher to be on this list and, and be featured as much as some of the big, big guys really feels wonderful and rewarding. Yeah, you're finding and putting out amazing, amazing work. And yeah, that so. is, that's, that's got to be the best feeling. <laughs> it, it is. It's pretty wonderful. Yeah. And you guys do thrillers. That's, oh, that's yeah, your we wheelhouse. Do, we do. We do a lot of crime fiction. I think partly by virtue of I sort of grew up in crime fiction. Uh, you know, I write kind of thrillers and suspense. Um, I'd worked at St. Martin's Press in the Minotaur line. Um, so I think I, I know the crime fiction world like mm -hmm. the back of my hand. So it's sort of when I'm starting up a company, it's let's let's do what I know I'm good at. Let's, you know, I know the community. I know the people who cover it. We do yeah. do other things. We do some, you know, upmarket literary fiction. We've done some young adult and kids books. and We've done some romance. Oh. Um, but it's sort of like mysteries and thrillers are bread and butter a little bit because I know that world. and I know what what to expect when we publish a book. Yeah, you have to do what you know. Yeah, and exactly. also so it doesn't hurt that it's having a moment right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the mysteries and thrillers never really go out of style. Yes, they're they're very evergreen. And yeah. and what do you think it it is that people respond to about the genre? Because it's hmm. just really hot right now. I think you know there there are a couple. Number one. Part of it's entertainment. Um, part of it is just really good mysteries and thrillers are, are fun to read. Uh, yeah. you know, the same way people like to watch good TV, whether it's Law & Order, whether it's The Wire, mm. whether it's Blue Bloods uh, or um, The Good Wife. They just love engaging stories with conflict, with interesting characters. So I think just from a pure entertainment standpoint, you know, thrillers can kind of kind of sate that. But at the same time, I think... Um, Part of the reason I think thrillers have, or some thrillers have really broken out is because they tackle issues beyond just sort of being entertaining. Um, they mm. like tackle, and, and, and granted, they've been doing that for a long time, but I do think, I think the mainstream media, to use a political term, uh, <laughs> is, is, is appreciating, appreciating that a little bit more. So when you look at, uh, yeah. at, at Gone Girl, which is, you know, I was, I love to say I was a Gill uh, Gillian Flynn fan from b even before Gone Girl, but, you know, Gone Girl really the OG the Gillian Flynn. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you like Sharp Objects is still fantastic. Um, yeah. But how Gone Girl tackled sort of like the trope of the, of the the cool girl, which is you know, as a guy, everyone talks about cool girls. Oh, you want to date the cool girl? So to see a book really <laughs> just, just sort of like deconstruct that completely was pretty brilliant. Or and turn uh, it on its know, head. Oh, exactly. Uh, and or the girl on the train, which is you know really twisty, entertaining thriller. But it really, but the main character is very relatable, not only because she has a massive drinking problem, but the notion <laughs> of being, but, but also the notion of being gaslit. Um, you yeah. know, there's so many twists, and you, you, how you think this woman is just a giant basket case, but as the story unfolds, you realize that may, you know, maybe somebody's been manipulating maybe she's her a little right. bit. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and especially but, now with sort of politics the way it is, you know, the, the notion of, of our country being gaslit comes up so often. Uh, so for a book to sort of tackle that again head on, it helps a thriller break out from just being sort of like entertaining to this is actually topically relevant. So it's something that's in the cultural zeitgeist that's working exactly. its way into Some, our Somebody books. can read that book and say, oh, my God, that, you know, this happened to me or this is the way I feel or I can relate to this character. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's the relatability plus a really great story to boot. Yeah. And, they, you know, they don't yeah. always go hand in hand, you know. Uh, but I, I think that the mysteries and thrillers that break out have a combination of that really entertaining story with characters and situations that can be very relatable. 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So uh, we're running out of time. So I'm going to ask you one more question. Mm -hmm. So if you had any advice for your fellow authors and publishers, <laughs> What would it be? <laughs> oh, well, those are uh, two very, two different, very different subsets of people. Uh, although, you know, <laughs> as, you know, authors now can be their own publishers. I think, you know, I think yeah. that's one of the things. If you're going to publish your own books, uh, I don't mean through an independent press. I mean, publish them yourself. You do have to act like a publisher. Uh, you essentially are, un you know, unless your goal is to just get the book available online and have some copies for friends and family, you have to run your publishing as a small business uh you oh, have to completely. think about marketing and publicity and reviews and attention it's not just enough to have your book available online but how are people going to come to it besides you know your your mailing list um so you really have to think about you know when i did the castle one of the first things i did was think about how am i going to get the word out so i got review copies out to outlets i booked myself on a whole bunch of radio and, and podcasts um i knew authors who could review it um so you really have you to think about that. You know, exactly. Uh, PW and Booklist gave it a great review, and Seattle Review of Books interviewed me. Um, so you really have to think about how are people going to find out about your book. Um, yeah. So I think you know it's and and one, I think one of the good you know self publishing or indie publishing has really come a long way because I remember when I when I was starting out in the industry, self publishing was really sort of looked down upon. Um, yeah. It was, hey, the, the only the only people that do this are the ones who are, aren't good enough to get published, uh, and that's just not true anymore. Because there are a lot of authors who are major best selling authors or award winners who do it themselves because they choose to. Um, yeah. So you know, uh, and you know, there were occasionally books that got self published and then picked up by major publishers, but they're usually sort of books that had somehow sold, you know, hit hit a nerve somehow. But now there it's are the a Fifty fair Shades amount, of Grey so, phenomenon. Um, Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. back then, I think it was like the Celestine Prophecy or the Shack or book books like that that you know had somehow sold hundreds of thousands of copies self-published. But um, yeah, there there are more instruments out there for authors who want to publish their own stuff. But at the same time, I think there's a responsibility that comes with it because you know I always say this when I'm when I'm on a, on a panel is that there's too much information available to you to not be knowledgeable. Mm, exactly, and there's so much good you know, educational, you know, stuff just even on Spark that we've, you know, given mm -hmm. people. So please go out and look at it and and figure out what your publishing program as an author looks like. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's the thing you need to, and especially if you're going to do more than one book, you should have a program. You should figure out how one book is going to tie into the other and how you're going to promote your entire, you know, backlist. Exactly, exactly. Use your backlist to promote your, promote your front list. So use your old exactly. books to promote a, your new books. You know, we do the same thing at Polis Books. We do that a lot. Where you know, you know, for example, we have a, a new book from an author named Rob Hart coming out this summer. It's the fifth book in his series. And we're going to do just as much promotion for the first four books in the series as we did for the as we're doing for the new book. Yeah, got to start with book run to read book five. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that's why you, yeah. a lot of times you'll see the first book in a series sells better five years in than in its first year. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that is fantastic advice. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Please check out Jason's books. They're all really fantastic. Uh, he mentioned Thanks. The Castle, which is a great book. And uh, go check out all of his other ones, too, uh, if you love a good political thriller. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Jason. And uh, thank, you. thank you for having me. This was fun. <laughs> Of course. And I'll, I'll, wait, I'll wait and I'll wave to you from across the Hudson. Yes, please do. And uh, please join us again for the next episode of Go Publish Yourself, the Author Spotlights. We'll see you next time. Hi, everyone. This is Robin Cutler, director of Ingram Spark. Thanks so much for tuning in to this special spotlight feature episode where authors and publishers just like you share their experience on what's worked for them. We hope these episodes inspire you on your own publishing journey. And if you're ready to publish today, visit the Ingram Spark website. For more tips on publishing like a pro, subscribe to our podcast and weekly blog, or check out our new free online self publishing courses available in the brand new Ingram Spark Academy. Thanks for joining us today and talk to you soon.